Well, good evening and uh, welcome to the studios for Debakey CV Live. Uh, thank you for joining us on this very important evening here in Houston because this happens to be game six of the World Series and just about two hours time uh, there's going to be the first pitch and we hope it's going to be an Astros win. So I apologize uh, for those of you who are watching from the DC area. I'm joined tonight with uh, Dr. Randy Wolf. Um, and Dr. Randy Wolf is a member of our faculty and he's an expert in a particularly uh, type of surgical treatment for atrial fibrillation. So Randy, thank you for uh, being here tonight and teaching us a little bit about AFib. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, a lot of people want to learn more about AFib. A lot of people have it. So it's really interesting. In a number of my friends who have <laughs> AFib, it's like an epidemic that's actually <laughs> taking place. And so yeah. whenever you start talking about AFib, you're out at a party or something like that, there's a huge amount of interest in it because if they don't have it, they know somebody who's got it. That's right. And it, it's a pretty big public health burden at the moment, Archley. <laughs> Well, people are starting to look at that, and uh, you're right, Alan. If you look at the cost to society, and this is something you've looked at before with stroke, it's huge. I think it's like $150,000 a person, someone has a stroke, not to mention the patient and their family, but the cost to society is high. And AFib is the most dreaded complication of it. I mean, stroke is the most dreaded complication of AFib. Yeah, so, so my job here tonight is, I don't know a whole lot about AFib. So yeah, my yeah. job is to be here and ask kind of this kind of the dumb questions. And so they're not dumb. So so let's talk about AFib. So let's say my heart is in atrial fibrillation and let's say the rate is ninety. I feel fine. Do I care? Well you probably don't know you have AFib unless you walk up a flight of stairs. And this is something we go through with the patients by history. About half the patients that have AFib don't feel it. They don't feel the palpitations. The other half can tell you the minute they go into AFib and the minute they go out. Why do some people feel it and some don't? We don't know. So then we ask, well, how about fatigue? Where's your bedroom? It's on the second floor. Well, has there been any difference going upstairs to go to bed? Well, yeah, the last few months I've noticed I'm kind of out of breath when I get to the top of the stairs. That's probably when they went into AFib continuously. Other people have it intermittently. It's not unusual to go back and ask a patient, how long do you think you've been having these palpitations? And somebody will say, I've had these since high school. I had them when I was playing football and the coach said, get back in there. You're strong as a horse. So I think some of these people have had them almost their whole life. But the natural history of the disease is you get more episodes, they're closer together, and they last longer until ultimately the heart goes out of rhythm and won't go back in. So what causes it? Well, if we figure that out, we can share the Nobel Prize. So nobody no, really knows nobody what causes knows. AFib. Nobody knows. There are, there are several theories. Uh, one is inflammation because, uh, as you know, after open heart surgery and people that have never had AFib, the AFib rate post-op is about 35%. So that's really interesting because it's one of the things we obviously look at because it drives length of stay, for example, and, mm -hmm. and patients get AFib, then they got to be anticoagulated. And so is the thought process that it's inflammation from the surgery that's, that causes this? <laughs> that's that's one, one potential etiology. Another one is, and the one that I subscribe to, is that most people have lone AFib. In other words, they don't have coronary disease, they don't have mitral valve disease. So is that the majority of people? Yes, that's the majority. Okay. We call that standalone AFib. Yeah. And uh, they do have, most. a lot of them have obstructive sleep apnea, they have hypertension, but they don't have uh, heart disease other than the AFib. And I believe in those patients it's an imbalance of the autonomic nervous system. There are a lot of vagal nerve fibers around the back of the heart and guess where they are? They're right where the pulmonary veins are. So when we talk about the autonomic nervous system and we in medical school are taught there's two parts to that. There's the sympathetic which tends to be part of that fight, fright or flight syndrome. It's yeah. a stimulant. Then there's a parasympathetic system which tends to do the opposite and kind of slow things down. And so you think there's an imbalance mm -hmm. in between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system? I do. There are thousand, thousands of tiny nerves on the back of the heart. Uh, it's not studied by surgeons very much, but people have looked at this. And 80% of those nerves are mixed. So they're sympathetic, parasympathetic together. Uh, what I developed was a way to test these on the outside of the heart touch down on the outside of the heart with a tiny stimulus. You couldn't even feel it on your finger. But if we hit a spot that's active, the heart just stops. Mm -hmm. Diastolic arrest, 
the heart stops until we stop stimulating and it starts beating again. So there's no question that that plays a role. And in dogs and, and other places where they've studied them, you put an animal in AFib, you inject alcohol around those nerves mm -hmm. on the outside of the heart, the AFib goes away mm -hmm. right now. Interesting. So, so there's something to it. I'm asking all the questions here, but I just wanted to remind the audience that um, there is a line that you can text in, or, and there's also a telephone line that you can call in. And so those numbers are, for calling is 713, don't take my glasses off to see that far away, 713-441-8560, or text the bakey to 37607. Um, online polev.com slash the forward slash the bakey. So please, if you got any questions, do what I'm doing, picking his brain here yeah. to get the questions answered that I don't know the answers to. Okay, so let me. One so you don't have to wait till the end of the of no. the show to call in. Call in anytime. Call in anytime. Okay. Sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. How on earth does sleep apnea cause AFib? Well, again, it's probably the autonomic nervous system. It could be a change in the CO2. We don't know for sure. We do know this. If someone's treated for AFib successfully, but their obstructive sleep apnea is not treated, their chance of relapse is 44% greater. Okay. So it's significant. So how do you check for sleep apnea? Well, first, the best, the best thing to do is take a history. Uh, a lot of these patients are seen by sleep specialists, but a simple history is, is very helpful. Number one, if you're sleeping with somebody else, you ask the partner, does your partner stop sleeping in the middle of the night? A lot of times stop, they know. Stop breathing in the middle of the night. I mean, sleep, yeah. uh, stop breathing in the middle of the night. Yeah. A lot of times they know. They'll say, oh, yeah, he stops breathing for 30 seconds. I almost get ready to hit him, and he starts breathing again. That's number one. Number two is fatigue. Patients that have sleep apnea that, is, that have not had treatment are really tired during the day. By noontime, they're ready to lie down and take a nap. So I'd say fatigue that you didn't usually have and to someone who's with you says he stops breathing or she stops breathing. If any of those, any of those questions are yes, then it's best to see a sleep specialist and have a sleep study. And that's uh, uh, very diagnostic. Stay overnight in a sleep center. Okay. So what about smoking? Uh, you like to blame smoking. And yeah, smoking, smoking gets smoking. blamed yeah. on everything. Yeah. But I think it's multifactorial. Okay. I'm not sure about that. Uh, Alcohol? Uh, not sure about that either. If you got AFib, does drinking alcohol make it worse? It depends. Everybody's got a trigger for AFib, and I don't know if it's if they really know what triggers no. it. Some people say they can't take a cold drink. Some people say they can't take a hot drink. Okay. So I'm not sure how accurate it is. We studied a group of patients years ago. They wore the monitor, and they kept a diary when they thought they were in AFib. And then we went back and matched it up they were right half the time. Okay. So we're not very good, unless we're those certain people that know when they're out of AFib all the time. We're not very good at knowing when we're in and out of AFib. Okay, well, we got a question for you. All right. This is a good one. All right. Starts off, hey there, what is your opinion on the Watchman device? Um, what success have you seen with it, and what patients are ideal candidates? So let me, why don't you just tell us what We've the got Watchman... Go a little background, yeah, right? Yeah, a little background first, please. <clears throat> first of all, um, I've been closing the left atrial appendage, which is a little ear on the heart, for 16 years minimally invasively because there was evidence to show in patients who had AFib, if this little ear on the heart, like an appendix, was closed, it dramatically decreased the risk of stroke mm -hmm. to the point where patients don't even have to take a blood thinner even though their heart's out of rhythm if that little sac is closed. So, so we know that from his surgical history. But so is there any downside to leaving? You've clipped off the appendage, mm -hmm. the heart's still not in rhythm, but it's not like 150, mm -hmm. it's 80 or 90. Is there, is there any damage to the heart long term from that? No. Okay. If anything, there's improvement. Now there have been three articles that have come out that have shown that if that little ear on the heart, left atrial appendix, appendage or appendix is closed and someone has high blood pressure, the blood pressure goes down about 30 points. Oh, interesting. And it okay. seems to persist. So it's a change in the renin-aldosterone system, uh, renin-angiotensin-aldosterone. There's a lot of hormonal stuff going on. But the good news is if you have high blood pressure and AFib and the appendage is closed, 
your blood pressure will go down. We noticed that. So even Absolutely. in the clinic here at DeBakey, mm -hmm. on our orders, Alan, it says any blood pressure the patient was taking before we do close the appendage, afterwards half dose. Really? Because we know it's, it's going to be too much if they go back to their regular dose of oh, blood yeah. pressure medication. All right, let's go, go back to the watchman. Watchman. Yeah. You got lots so of questions coming The watchman doesn't close the appendage. It blocks the orifice of the appendage. And there's a difference there. It's, how can we explain that? Well, one is to just close the appendage, tie it off or cut it off, and then it's out of the system and it atrophies and becomes a scar. With the watchman, it's sort of like putting a cork in it, so it's still active. And there was a study done that showed it took two groups of people, one the watchman device, which is like a cork in the orifice mm -hmm. of the appendage, versus a device that closes the appendage. And guess what? Where they close the appendage, post-op, the blood pressure dropped 30 millimeters. Watchman didn't drop at all. So when you say uh, the appendage remains active, you mean as a electrical stimulus for ongoing atrial fibrillation? Is that what you mean? Yes, that's 50% yeah. of it. Okay. Uh, but it's still, it also uh, secretes something too. Okay. So it secretes a peptide that alters the, uh, the sodium. Okay, so let's see but, if we but, answer but this the question. Watchman, yeah. The last thing I want to say is all of them leak. Uh, what we do here at DeBakey is we close the appendage completely. There are no leaks, period. The watchman leaks like a sieve. They couldn't get it through the FDA, so they said, well, don't worry about the little leaks, only worry about the big leaks. And then they also said it decreased the stroke rate af af with AFib, which it does, but only the hemorrhagic strokes. But hemorrhagic strokes are because you're taking a blood thinner. And with the watchman, you stop the blood thinner. So it's not been shown to really decrease pieces of, or emboli, pieces of material leaving the heart and going to the brain. So I used to watch Bill O'Reilly, and he'd say, this is the no spin zone. So, yeah. you know, you're obviously, you're biased. Of you're a surgeon, you're biased. I, I mean, let biased. me pick up for the electrophysiologist and that watchman is a new treatment. Obviously, it's very appealing from the point of view of, don't get your chest open. Mm -hmm. You got a hole in your groin, you got to punch through the endoretrial septum uh, to be able to put the watchman in there. Now, I see these ads on TV, it says you can stop taking anticoagulation. That's true, after about uh, 12 weeks. The FDA mandated that patients who have the watchman stay on blood thinner for 12 weeks because there's an increased risk of stroke in the first 12 weeks after the watchman device. With what we do, never seen that. Okay. But I'm biased. You're biased, okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I think to put it in perspective, there is a role for watchmen. Um, there's different uh, configurations of the atrial appendage. Some of them are more appropriate than others. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of people out there, I don't want to scare them all to death, who've got watchmen implanted, mm -hmm. seem to be doing pretty well. So it, yeah. it's an option in the panoply of treatment options for atrial fibrillation. Okay, so let's move on. Are patients more likely to go into AFib during exercise? Good question. Uh, some of the patients I've operated on are marathon runners, and they'll get to a certain mile each time, mile 12, mile 17, and they, and they go into AFib. So I've seen that. On the other hand, I've had some patients that say, I'm in AFib, and the way I get up out of AFib is I run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it gives so, me AFib just thinking about running a marathon, quite honestly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I would say that what we do know is Certain things that cause a person stress increase the likelihood that they'll go out of rhythm. And again, I think that's more related to the nerves than anything else, the autonomic nervous system. It's not circulating fight or adrenaline. Flight. <laughs> What's that? It's not circulating adrenaline. Yeah, epinephrine. You think it's more... Well, it could be. Yeah, could, could be. be. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I know you've got a few slides to show, but let's take that's some of right. these questions. Are, are the treatment, op uh, the treatment option difference between paroxysmal or persistent AFib? And what's the success of alcohol ablation in resolving AFib? So there are a couple definitions I guess we better take care of first. Paroxysmal means that the heart goes in and out of AFib, but at any given time the heart may be in rhythm. When the patient's in the physician's office, there may be no AFib. Perfect sinus rhythm on the EKG but from time to time they go out of rhythm, but they're never out of rhythm for more than seven days. If the patient has had to have a cardioversion or a shock to get back in rhythm, or they've been continuously out of rhythm for seven days, mm -hmm. that's persistent. 
So parrot's so the definition. Point. It's that's persistently out of rhythm, the rhythm for seven days. For more seven days or more, or, more. or they've had to have a cardioversion. Mm -hmm. Then they have, by definition, persistent. Why do we make the distinction? Well, the AFib free rate, or you could say cure rate, but we don't use that. The AFib free rate is higher the less AFib you have going into it, which makes sense. So if the, for take an extreme example, if the heart's been out of rhythm for 10 years, mm -hmm. it's unlikely that anything will get it back in rhythm. Okay. But paroxysmal, where it's going in and out, well, maybe the AFib hasn't been there that long. Persistent, where it's staying in for more than seven days, or the patient has to have a shock, well, that's a little more resistant AFib. Okay. So the AFib free rate or cure rate is going to be a little bit lower. Okay, next question relates to this. Bad boy on my wrist here. Yeah, Apple Watch. Um, now I can, in fact, there was a big trial that was presented at ACC, but uh, mm -hmm. so what's your take on it? Um, number one, is it effective in detecting it? Number two, can I use it to manage it somehow? <laughs> well, I th overall, I think it's a good thing because I think more people are becoming aware of what their heart rhythm is. Uh, keep in mind that about 15% of patients with AFib present with a stroke. They don't know they have AFib until they have a stroke, and I've had patients like that, and uh, one patient was driving his car on the interstate on cruise control and slumped over. Miraculously, his wife grabbed the wheel and got him off the road. They went to the ER, and they evaluated this gentleman, came out to the wife and said, how long has your husband been in AFib? And she goes, what are you talking about? Had no idea. Mm -hmm. So we know that sometimes a presentation can be a stroke. Well, that's a hell of a way to learn about a disease. Yeah. So if you have an Apple Watch and you pick up some arrhythmia and you see your position, I think that's a good thing. That doesn't mean you're, you have AFib. It may not be. But at least it raises the awareness of the problem. And I think overall that may lower the stroke rate, which as we talked to before would be a good thing for everybody. Now. There are a lot of false positives on the Apple Watch, which means it might say you're out of rhythm and really you're not. Okay. But that's okay, that's okay. I think the awareness is an important thing. We have other devices that we use here at the Bakey. Uh, we put in the Lynx, quite common. That's a subcutaneous monitor, it's very accurate. The battery life is three years. It can be put in uh, just with a, a simple local anesthetic. And as you know, we even do these in the clinic. So I like and that. So the, so the way that that works is you put it in mm -hmm. and it uploads. It, it sends a signal out, but only about 10 feet. Okay. So mm -hmm. it, it, it goes to a device at the bedside in the middle of the night automatically, and then that comes to our office at the Bakey. So we know what somebody's rhythm is every day if we want. We get a readout at one month. It also tells us the AFib burden. For example, if a patient has an AFib burden of 80%, you probably ought to do something about so that. So 80% means 80% of, of, of the time you are in atrial fibrillation. Yeah. Okay. But All right. some people may have an AFib burden of 1%. Well, probably don't need to be as aggressive. So it's very helpful to us. So one of the things I'd always heard was that paroxysmal AFib, where you go in and out, is more dangerous than persistent AFib. Right or wrong? Mm -hmm. Wrong. Okay. But there's a third type of AFib, which wasn't on that question, which is long-standing persistent. It gets more complicated. That's where the heart's been out of rhythm for at least a year. The thinking behind uh, the question that you just posed was that if the heart's always out of rhythm, it's not going to suddenly go in rhythm and pump a blood clot out of the left atrial appendage into the brain. So the idea is that when AFib, the appendage is kind of sitting here like this. Yeah. But if suddenly it goes back into rhythm, yeah, that was the idea. So is that, in reality, what happens? Nobody knows. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, the, the clots that I've seen in patients that have AFib in the appendage are usually people that have been out of rhythm a long time. They're not the paroxysmal ones. Okay. But we don't know the answer. But for the audience out there, the ones of you that are taking blood thinners, you're taking a blood thinner essentially to prevent a clot in one place, mm. the left atrial appendage. So that's fascinating because one of the things I used to work on, actually, and it was we take systemic anticoagulation for f a focal need. Exactly. And it's not right. So th therein lies the complication rate from bleeding. You, you, you don't get bleeding in your atrial appendage. You're right. trying to stop clots in there, but you get bleeding elsewhere. Okay. All right. Lots of more questions. 
the big coffee question. Oh my gosh, I love coffee. And so I, I, I call it the nectar of the gods when I'm driving into work. The worst thing of my day is when I get in the car and I've forgotten to bring my coffee cup. You know, and the, the debate, do I go back home? But a lot of people love coffee. Does it make your AFib worse? Some people think it does, um, but we're not so sure about that. Oh. But it is a stimulant. Mm -hmm. Um, so it could, and here's a, a, another story that kind of blends in with that. I've had two patients that we treated successfully with a mini maze. They've done great for years. They went to their dentist, had an injection with an anesthetic that included a uh, epinephrine. Mm, epinephrine, okay. Went right into AFib. Is that right? I mean like that. I guess that makes sense. That's a stimulant. Yeah, yeah. So there's probably something to it. So decaf? I mean, again, but, but you, you don't know, but I mean, you've got patients I, who get AFib. Do you tell them that you recommend you drink decaf? No, I don't. Okay, all right. Because they, you know, patients want two things when they have AFib. One, they want to feel better, right? And, and two, they want hope. That's what they want. So we give them hope. We, give, we say, we're going to do a procedure that's going to allow you to drink coffee if you want to. Okay. Yeah, I remember not that long ago somebody said, hope's not a strategy. Is that kind of <laughs> I mean, the same thing applies for atrial fibrillation? No, no. All right, next question is, have you seen any differences in the manifestation of AFib across racial or ethnic groups? Okay, good question. The, an the short answer is no. I've, I've done the mini maze procedure in 20 countries. Uh, we just got back from China two weeks ago. AFib is everywhere. It's in Europe, it's in Asia, it's in Africa, it's in South America, it's in North America, it's in Australia. Okay. It seems to cross all ethnic lines. One thing that is important though is AFib history. Do you have anybody in your family that has AFib? And that may be more important than whether or not you drink coffee. Because if your mother and father had AFib and your brother has AFib, that's significant. Yeah, that's true of uh, How about most, that? most disorders that we know of. Yeah. I will say, that you want to live a long time, choose your patient, your parents very wisely. <laughs> and unfortunately, you don't get to make that no, choice. But no. um, I think the insurance companies figured out a long time ago how much your life insurance are going to sell you is based upon how old your parents were when they died. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about the uh, racial and ethnic groups. What about gender? Male and female? Any difference? Mm. Everybody gets it. Okay. Everybody. Yeah. But coronary artery disease is more common yeah. in men. Yeah, but uh, most of the people that have AFib have low in AFib. Okay. So, it's, so that's the majority of them. Yes. Coronaries are normal. Yes, that's maybe correct. Yeah, maybe it's protective. Yeah. Okay, I know you've got some slides you wanted to show no. us. We've been kind of taking a lot of questions, and that's wonderful. I'd encourage you to continue to send those questions in. One of the, uh, one he's on the hook, so now's the time to send the questions yeah. in. That's what I'm doing. Uh, what, one, of, one of our patients who came to Houston uh, is a... Uh, pilot, we see a lot of pilots because when they get AFib, they're grounded. That's their whole livelihood. It's a big deal. Uh, he was also a skydiver. He had the mini maze procedure, and he got back to doing the things he likes to do. And the, what I'm going to show you here, I think, is pretty stressful. This is a good stress test for AFib. He doesn't have AFib anymore, and he sent this to us. Uh, this is from California. This is Ross, and he's jumping out of a plane here. This is after he's had his mini maze. He's no longer grounded. He can fly. He can skydive again. And, uh, I don't think that's what flying that, we were thinking about that's when, a, you, when you talked about him. Yeah, that's we were good, thinking in a big 737 behind one of these steering wheels. Well, he, he does that out, too. He, jump, yeah, <laughs> no, he, he jumps out too. a perfectly good plane. So this is what he sent us from the air. Oh, very nice. So for any of you in the audience who want more information about specifically okay. what we do here at the Bakey, you can go to wolfminimaze.com or you can call 877-900-2342. Are you serious? This is what he, this has been filmed while yeah. he was skydiving? Yeah. No. Yes. Really? Okay. Yeah, see, he's got a, yeah. a camera on his helmet, yeah, and his good. buddy had one, too. And, oh, uh, yeah, I see it. I'd I say it. if you don't get AFib again after the surgery and you can do this, yeah. I think you're cured. <laughs> yeah, probably, what do you think? Probably pretty predictive, you I would you got to see the yeah. flyaway here, because this is pretty cool. Here he goes. Bye-bye, Ross. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Very nice. So this is okay. what I think people want to do. They want to stop blood thinners, eliminate strokes, and get in rhythm. And what we do is based on a clamp technology that I helped develop. 
and this shows the back of the heart and if an AFib focus might be towards the top and we'll show it here as a so this yellow is the left dot. atrium that's the and left what atrium. we're looking at here are the pulmonary veins coming back from the lungs huh right and that's the focus of AFib maybe it comes from the nerves as we talked about maybe from the muscle so, so again the, so. the idea is that there's one hyper excitable area and it's firing off these electrical signals that causes the heart to go out of rhythm the top two chambers of the heart to go out of rhythm and we simply make a line a very controlled burn like a pencil line and that stops the electrical activity because a scar has no water and a lot of people, I think even a lot of physicians don't really understand why ablation works. It's simply a scar. Mm -hmm. We're very good conductors of electricity because we're mostly water, but a scar will not transmit electricity because there's no water in it. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. So we make that line in about 10 seconds, and we've proved that. These are animal studies that show that that line is continuous, there are no gaps. So uh, what we're what looking prevents. at is a, hmm? a piece of the heart that's been taken out. Yeah. And, and even the, though the clamp was on the outside, Alan, this yeah. is the line on the inside. And that blue line is the staining which shows collagen or scar. Right. Yeah. So if the abnormal electrical activity is over here and it wants to go here to stimulate the rest of the heart, it can. Yeah, yeah. It hits the scar and bounces back. So do you get the same um, scarring when an electrophysiologist does ablation? Not, not usually. Surface. I think their job is very difficult, Alan, because they're really making spot welds inside the heart. It's like spot welding underwater, and they're hoping they that lines, all the dots they try to are make close enough. Join these dots together and make lines. Right. That's what they're trying to do, yeah. but it's not easy. No. Very difficult. This, difficult. With this clamp, it takes about 10 seconds. So we've been doing this for some time, the minimally invasive procedure since 2003, and it looks like this. This is done under general anesthesia. These are the ports. So uh, people are familiar with having their knee scoped or having the gallbladder taken out by a scope with a scope. We use the same scope. We go between the ribs and we can see the heart. We can see everything. These are the pulmonary veins. We can see them clearly. We can put the clamp on. We can make that line in about 10 seconds. And by the way, the appendage is over here and we can take care of that. How do you know when, you've, when the scarring is complete? Well, we test before we make the line, mm -hmm. and we see electrical oh, you, activity, okay, so then we you, test after the line. So it's like you an right electrical here. stimulus on the pulmonary veins, and you see whether it's conducted to the heart. And the idea being when you create this ablation line, Disappears. that should go away. Okay. Yeah. And do you measure the temperature of the, is there a resistance measurement inside the probe itself? Yes, we're measuring impedance. When impedance goes to infinity, then we're not going to burn anymore. Okay. So it's a dynamic process. And there you can see the line right there. And this is on the right side. The lungs are over here. The heart is over here to the right. And that's the clamp and that's the line that's made. This is the right atrium. This is the left atrium. We can see the pulmonary veins. We can make the burn very quickly and isolate those pulmonary veins. Like a catheter ablation only, I like to say it's a little more complete because we get a transmural lesion every time. Now, left atrial appendage, we talked about it already. It decreases the chance of stroke, you can stop blood thinners, and it also can be a focus of AFib. We've had several patients where the heart stays in AFib, the last thing I do is close the appendage. Close the appendage, three beats later, sinus rhythm. Just like that. And I don't think it's just serendipity, I think we're changing something. So I think I asked you this once before. Is there a function for the appendage? Before we're born, the appendage is the back of the left atrium, but then the pulmonary veins grow in from the lungs into the heart. And when they do, they push that little back of the heart out to the side, and that becomes the appendage. Oh, okay. It has some hormonal activity, but you have two appendages. We only remove one. The only thing I've seen that happen in over 2,000 cases is patients get better, their blood pressure goes down. So do you ever see clot in the right atrial appendage? Mm -hmm. Very rarely. Why is that? Well, it's, it's got a much broader base. It's a much bigger appendage. The pressures are a little bit different. And if a clot does leave there, it's going to go into the, into the pulmonary vascular where it's probably going to be dissolved. But no, it's kind of unusual to see it. Very interesting. Usually the orifice of the left atrial appendage is rather narrow. Okay. So it really creates a true cul-de-sac, a dead end. 
Uh, and as you know, doesn't if you're a mammal, if your blood slows down enough, it's going to clot. Yep. Okay, we've got another question. Can I still get the wolf mini maze even if I've had multiple rounds of ablation? The answer is Do yes. Do you ever see a patient who's not in ablation? <laughs> 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 yes, but uh, very commonly patients have had multiple ablations. In fact, those are the best patients because they've already been picked by the electrophysiologist to be a good candidate. So these are the patients that tend to have a smaller left atrium and a higher chance of success. Mm. Over time, in AFib, the heart does get bigger. And one, at some point, it's too much to get back into rhythm. So those patients have So why is that? Well, why does a big atrium equal persistent AF? Well, we think that some of the, uh, these abnormal circuits are self-sustaining once, uh, once the heart gets really big. And you get scarring, too. So okay. it's not a normal uh, uh, myocardial function anymore. Okay. This is, I was just going to show quickly the left side. Someone asked about the watchman. I'd like to show the atra clip, which I guess you could say is a competitor to the watchman. It looks like this. This is one of our patients here. This was from a couple months ago here at DeBakey in Methodist Hospital. That's the left atrial appendage. No blood thinners, no heart lung machine, three little incisions, and we can occlude the base of the left atrial appendage. This is the heart over here. We've opened the heart sac, and we put a clip on there. It's kind of like a hair clip, although I think it's a little more expensive than a hair clip. <laughs> yeah, you just a, a few, little. You buy a few hair clips <laughs> for what that costs. <laughs> and then we remove the applier, and the appendage is clipped. Why we're doing this, we're also looking at an echo, a transesophageal echo. So we prove that it looks good grossly, and we prove on echo that the orifice is completely closed. This procedure takes about 30 minutes in our OR. Looks scary stuff, you know, if what patients are going to say, we're looking at a horror, you're looking at all the pretty gory looking. How big a deal is this? Well, there's no such thing as a minor procedure when it's on you. In right? your heart in particular. Uh, so this is still uh, heart surgery, but it's done minimally invasively. In our hands, it's been incredibly safe. Uh, you know, you keep track here. We've, mm -hmm. This has been an incredibly safe procedure here at Methodist. Uh, there are, I think there's a learning curve, uh, so if someone wants a mini maze, they should make sure that whoever they're seeing has done quite a few of them. Because mm -hmm. most surgeons, heart surgeons, are not that comfortable working through the scope on the beating heart. So we hear a lot about robotics mm -hmm. in heart surgery these days. I mean, it's, you know, you were involved in the original development of the robot. Can mm -hmm. you say a little bit about how that began, and is there a role for this going forward? I thought there would be a role. I did the initial FDA study for da Vinci, which by the way was all heart surgery. It wasn't prostate surgery. That came later. And I thought that in the lab with the biomedical engineers that I worked with at University of Cincinnati, we could create this procedure with the da Vinci robot. But we ran into a snag, and that is in this procedure, we have to go around the back of the heart. And there's a period of time where we don't see our instrument. But the way I do it now, thoroscopically, I can feel where I am. I feel resistance. Da Vinci doesn't have any force feedback. Mm -hmm. So you could put excess force and not know it. So that's where we stopped with the development. Otherwise, I think you could do it. But force feedback is, can you feel it? Is there yeah. haptic feedback? Yeah. And it doesn't have it. Are you going to show us any more slides? <laughs> yeah, I've got a few more things here. Um, we, we uh, did publish on this fact that, that it may be the nerves on the outside of the heart that are responsible for initiating the AFib. It may not uh, be just the muscle itself. So that's another advantage of that clamp. When we close that clamp and fire it, if there are any nerves on the outside of the heart, they're gonna be burned. Mm -hmm. But from the inside of the heart, it's very hard to get to the nerves because they're on the outside of the heart. So oh. with a catheter ablation, it's not easy to get the ganglionic plexi. This uh, is the article that we first published in 05, first 27 cases, 93% short-term AFib free. And this has been referenced, oh gosh, hundreds of times. So this was really a seminal article on a different way to treat uh, AFib. This was a patient who had three catheter ablations. And although they had three catheter ablations, when we look at the EKG, there's a surface ECG here. Mm -hmm. This is the EKG on the pulmonary vein, and it's not flat. 
So they're still transmitting energy into their pulmonary vein, so they don't have complete isolation of the pulmonary vein even after three catheter ablations. We put the clamp on, we fire it, and then we test again, and now look, that second line, mm. now the pulmonary vein is quiet. Okay. So we've proven that we've isolated the pulmonary vein. So I think it's a, it's a more complete isolation of the pulmonary vein. This is that, a picture of that link device, subcutaneous monitor. Uh, we use this pre-op in some patients because we don't know how much AFib they're having. We need to get a better handle on it. And we use it post-op routinely to wean their medications. If they're not having AFib, we get them off their medications. Okay. It's very objective. These are some results that, that we published. Uh, very high AFib free rates out to six years with the different types of AFib that we already mentioned. Um, the Germans are very good at keeping records. They keep records of every catheter ablation that's done in Germany. Uh, two years ago when they compiled the results, they looked at all the places that did catheter ablation in Germany. What was the chance of the patient being in rhythm after one catheter ablation in Germany? It was 44%, not really that high. So a lot of patients require a second and third ablation. With the mini maze, we've never had to repeat it. Okay, is that right? Yeah, it's interesting. One of my patients we sent that was ablated a couple of times, was still in AFib, and I, and I, that, that, I always laugh when I went back and said, they're gonna do it again? He said, they'd burn my whole heart out if I gave them <laughs> half a chance. I'm not having that done again. And so, I, look, I think there's clearly a role for ablation. Um, but there is a point where you go, okay, this ain't working, and that's kind of the question is, at what point in time do you switch over? So help us, help me understand where mini maze should be in the treatment algorithm. Okay. Patients got new AFEB. They've had five runs lasting an hour over three weeks. And uh, let's say they've tried medication, doesn't help them much. Yep. Okay, they're on a blood thinner now. Yep. And their options are, take a stronger medication to try to stay in rhythm. Uh, the strongest one is amiodarone. It works pretty well, but it has a lot of side effects. A lot of people read about it and they don't want to take it anymore. And it will wear off as well, but it's a reasonable way to go for starters. There are other antirhythmics, but generally after a couple of years, they stop working. Okay. That's one option. Second option, catheter ablation. Minimally invasive, although I think it scars the heart more than the mini maze. So it's smaller incisions on the heart, I mean on, on the skin, bigger scars on the heart. Oh, that's an interesting way of thinking about it. And you, yeah. can't, you can't close the appendage unless you do a second procedure with the catheter ablation. And thirdly, you can't get the nerves which are on the outside of the heart. But still, catheter ablation is reasonable. If you have one and you do great, fine. In my opinion, if you've had a couple and you still have AFib, I think you ought to try the mini maze. Okay. Another way to look at it is some patients say, look, I live in Panama, I can't take blood thinners. We've had this situation. I want the mini maze. If for some reason the mini maze doesn't work, you can go back and do a catheter ablation. And we've done that. And amazing results, Alan. There was a paper just published recently, 25 patients tw had a mini maze, 23 who had recurrence, out of a big number, but these were people that didn't respond to the mini maze. 23 out of the 25 were in rhythm after we went back and did a catheter ablation. Hmm. Interesting. So one doesn't rule out the other. You can start with the catheter ablation, you can start with the mini maze. That's the whole idea of a hybrid type procedure. Yeah. Okay. Start with one, but go to the other if you need to. So if I have a mini maze and then I need an aortic valve or a coronary bypass, does it make it more difficult? No, it shouldn't. Okay. because the whole anterior part of the pericardium is intact. All right, so here's another question. What's the best way to get in touch with you if I want to see if I'm a candidate for mini maze? Well, we have a slide for that. And it's this slide right here. It's 877-900-2342. Uh, we're very proud of the fact that we don't really use the answering service. We have somebody who answers the phone. And it's 877-900-2342 is AFib. AFIB. And I think this is the slide right here that has the number on it just so people can see. Right here. So you can either go to wolfminimaze.com, click a button and register, or you can call 877 900 
AFib, which is 2342. Okay. So we're getting towards the end of our hour. I had uh, something I wanted to show. I mentioned the skydiver. Yep. And we showed a little video of him. This is what Ross came up with. And this is a slide of Ross's personal AFib treatment decision matrix. And he goes through exactly what you just asked. What to do. Who's Ross? And he put down, he's one of my patients. Okay, oh, Ross, not, Ross. not a Dr. Ross. This no, is not Dr. Ross. Ross. Ross, okay. All righty. The one who was skydiving. Okay, yeah. He's, he lives in California, a very thoughtful guy. And he said, I really want to look at this objectively as much as you can with AFib. So he put down uh, what, what you, you should think of. Well, one is do nothing. Another is just do a cardioversion and take medications. The third thing is have a catheter ablation. And the fourth is a mini maze. And he put down the pros and cons of each one on a piece of paper. That's interesting. So, so how does the audience get a hold of this? Just call us. We'll send it to them. Okay. We're happy to very send it to them. But I think it's very thoughtful. And yeah. it's from a patient. Yeah. So oh, what? Oh, it was more meaningful. There's another situation. I that think we have. Let me interrupt because okay. I think we've got, we got a caller on the line who okay. wants to ask a question. Right. So go ahead, caller. Uh -huh. uh, hello, Dr. Wolf? Yes. Go ahead. Hi, yeah, my name is Steven from Waco, Texas. Spoke with you yesterday. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> when I first got diagnosed with AFib and was in heart failure, I was 43 years old. It was about a year and a half ago. And everybody in the hospital was surprised that it is that I'm so young that it happened to me as I'm so young. I guess most of the patients they were seeing were older. Mm -hmm. um, so... My question to you is regarding the Wolf Mini Maze, is that a uh, procedure that would benefit somebody at my age or is it something that's typically done to people a little older? Uh, good question, Stephen. Uh, thanks for your call. Uh, the youngest patient that I've personally done a Mini Maze on was 15 years old. Right. And the oldest is 90. So quite a range. But you, you bring up something we really haven't talked about and that is people who present with heart failure. And it's, they go out, they're generally young patients, they go out of rhythm, and their heart rate is very fast. And that's what you had. In fact, didn't you arrest in the ER or the hospital? Or maybe went off the line, but I think he even had a cardiac arrest. Uh, and uh, the reason is sometimes when you're young and you go into AFib, you have a good conduction system, you conduct at a very fast rate. So I think he had a heart rate of 200. Well, that's almost like having VTAC. Sure. And the heart is a simple organ. It has to have time to fill to pump. So if your heart rate's too fast, it doesn't fill enough to pump, and you go into heart failure. So we've seen, fortunately, many patients who've had heart failure from AFib. He, this uh, fellow had a heart cath. His coronaries are fine. We get them back in rhythm, and two years later, their heart function is normal. His was 10%. His EF was 10%. Normal is over 50 but we've had patients that two or three years later have had 15% EFs and two or three years later, normal EF. So it's reversible. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah, it's a very interesting phenomenon. So we've been talking about the magic that you do in the operating room, but you, you also got a hobby. You want to tell us about your hobby? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, I have a vocation and an avocation. Uh, I'm, I'm keep it, this is my day job, but it's, it's, it's almost time to change over to my <laughs> avocation. And uh, I don't know if I should do this because I was thinking about it. You know, this is video. You can slow this sucker down. We're going to figure it all <laughs> out. Yeah. Why do you think we asked you to do it? <laughs> One of the first <laughs> books that, that uh, the first book that I ever read when I was a teenager in magic was called Magic Without Apparatus, using simple everyday objects to do magic. And that's what we have here. Which camera should I look at, Chief? The one straight ahead? That one over there. Okay. So I've got, I brought with me three styrofoam cups and some water. So this uses everyday ordinary objects. And I'll take a drink just to prove it's not special water. <laughs> Works with vodka too, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the audience's job is very simple. All you have to do is keep your eye on which cup has the water. We'll put this over here so there's no confusion. We'll pour it in here. 
me stand up here so I can get an angle here. And we'll pour it in here. Pretty simple. Now, this is when it's nice to cut to a commercial, but we'll stay <laughs> live here. We don't want any TV camera tricks. So where's the water? Oh my gosh. Uh, you want we should have an online poll to try and figure this one out. <laughs> Metal one. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I usually do this trick after dinner, so people have been drinking, and then sometimes I can confuse them. But so you think it's in the middle, which is what the audience thinks. So that means if we pick up this cup over here, Dr. Lumsden says You're probably pour not it over. Here. Now. <laughs> yeah, it should be empty. Okay, should be empty. Just so we don't confuse things, we'll put this over here. This is the other end cup. Feels a little heavy to me. Mm. But the audience was watching and they said there's no water in there and they are correct. Now we'll nest those so there's no question. That leaves this cup and we have a dry top here on the counter and the water should be in here, right? But see, you were distracted just for a second. When you were distracted, the water disappeared. The water is not here. It's not in here. The water has gone. And that's the famous water trick. All righty. Very good. <laughs> very, very good. All righty. That's how you make these now, here's the sympathetic nerves go away. For I, used to do, I used to do magic before surgery, but I stopped doing it. I only do it after surgery now because a few people who saw me do magic, then had surgery, came out and they looked and they go, I wonder if you really did anything. <laughs> <laughs> so now I only do magic after the procedure. So we need to start winding this up. Uh, mm -hmm. Any final comments or uh, tidbits you want to give us? Yeah. Yes, thank you for the, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to present mm -hmm. here. So this is a great forum and I hope everybody that's listening tunes into this. Do you call it a station or what do you, or just, this well, no, we put the number up. I know, but them. I mean, what this whole thing that you're doing every Oh, week. yeah, so, so this is, um, we're, we're on an organization called the Bakey Education. It's part of Houston Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. Um, and, you know, we, we're funded by the DeBakey Foundation, and our mission is to try and bring cardiovascular education to the world. And we've been working on this for several years, and the, the latest and greatest addition to that portfolio is to build the studio. And one of the things we're going to be doing is actually, uh, you know, I think it's going to be called First Monday, is broadcasting out of here to Houston Independent School District. And that, that's not just going to be health education, it's also going to be as, as part of a meeting I run called Pumps and Pipes, where we get together with the energy business and NASA and aerospace. Well, first one's coming up and it's going to be about uh, from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena relayed through here. So it's a, it's a great place that we can actually bring out information um, around cardiovascular topics. And we want to do this for, from students, high school students, all the way up through uh, health professionals who are having to retrain and to patients, which is really what the thrust of this is. Well, you have a lot of good programs here, so I think people should know this isn't your only program. It's a whole plethora of different programs. Here's my advice to people that either have AFib or you have a loved one that has AFib or a friend. It's a chronic disease. Do your homework. It's not like appendicitis. Appendicitis, you go to the nearest hospital and have surgery. Chronic disease, get on the internet. Check out your options. Get a second opinion. We had a patient yesterday who was concerned about coming to see us uh, because they thought maybe their doctor would be offended. And I said what I always say, the only thing you should be worried about is the physician who doesn't want you to get a second opinion. Get a second opinion, get a third opinion if you need to. Find out what's best for you. And it may be something we mentioned, maybe something else. So you have, with a chronic disease, you have the chance to do your homework. And lastly, I would say, if you've been told, and a lot of people have been told this by their primary care or somebody, you have AFib, you just have to live with it, you'll be fine, take your blood thinner. We have evidence that says that's not true. The incidence of heart failure goes up with long-term AFib. Patients don't live as longer with AFib, and there's definitely a risk of stroke. So if you can do something about your AFib, you should. Well, that's great. Now, let me ask you one other thing, is that you have been working on providing second opinion services online, where you Good can point. communicate remotely and you know, patients don't even need to come down here. It's an opportunity that they can talk to you, 
because you know we really don't want people to travel if it's not something that they would uh, benefit from. So how does that work? Well, it's an excellent point. Last year we saw patients just with AFib from 32 U.S. states, but with the system that you've set up with the Bakey, uh, we have a TV. Um, we have a what would you call it? It's a TV camera, and we can take your your information. We can do a virtual visit wherever you are. We've already tested this out when, in a physician's office where the patient's in the physician's office a thousand miles away from Houston and I've talked to the patient, gotten their history and I have all the information there. I can see the patient, the patient can see me and we can make a intelligent decision on what we should do before the patient ever flies to Houston, Texas. Right. So it's uh, telemedicine at its best, I think. Yeah, telemedicine is going to change the way we operate. Okay, so I think, um, as I say, the Astros are, are going to take the field in an hour and 15 minutes. It's probably time when we're going to start losing our audience, particularly those in town. So yeah. i got to say, go Astros. Uh, let me thank Dr. Wolf uh, and the crew here for uh, spending the evening with us and talking about atrial fibrillation. Thanks very much, Randy. Thank Appreciate you. it.